Welcome to episode 32, Construction Nation. This is Sue Dyer, your host of Construction Dream Team, where I interview industry leaders and experts so you can learn about the people side of construction and build your construction dream team based on OPE, other people's experiences. The shortest way to success is to learn from others who've already been there and done that. They've paid the dues so you don't have to. And that is exactly what we do here on Construction Dream Team. We bring you the leading experts in the industry so that you can learn what you can do today to begin to build your construction dream team. So for those of you who have been listening to the episodes each week, Remember, every single leader and expert brings a resource that they give as a gift to all the listeners. And we have compiled all of those on one webpage at constructiondreamteam.com forward slash resources. There is a myriad of wonderful things there. So please go check that out. So let us dive into today's episode. I am so excited to have Sanim Malolo here with us. She is someone that we've been working with for about five years on various partnering research projects. And today she's going to talk about the latest one that came out that she's been working on, which is the ACRP Collaborative Partnering Research. And so welcome, Sanim. Welcome to Construction Dream Team. Thank you. Hello, Sue. So let me tell you a little bit more about Sanim, so you'll want to know her even more. So she is the Program Director of Construction Management, Associate Professor of the School of Planning, Design, and Construction at Michigan State University. She is LEED accredited and a CGP designated professional. She received her PhD from Penn State, in architectural engineering in 2007, and her dissertation on high-performance green building delivery. She has quite an interdisciplinary background, so it really helps a lot in the research that we're doing because she can look at both the technical side and the people side and kind of pull it all together. So I really think she's going to be a phenomenal person for all of you out there in Construction Nation to learn from. So I know that you have had a journey to get where you are, to being the program director of construction management at uh, Michigan State. So tell us a little bit about your journey to getting here. Sure. Well, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Sue. So I never planned for this, so I should just get started with that. Uh, I went to um, school uh, at undergraduate level for architecture in Turkey. That's where I, I was brought up. And during my junior year at the undergraduate level, I started doing a summer internship in one of the biggest and most populated cities in the world. That's Istanbul. It's eight to 10 million people. And just working in that city, uh, I was amazed by all the construction going on at all times of high rise infrastructure, the construction going on at, you know, all corners of the city all around you. And when I went back to my hometown, Izmir, at the end of that summer, I started uh, working for an architectural office where we were doing um, design build work for renovation projects for historical buildings. And I was basically the smallest uh, fish uh, there in the pond, helping out with daily operations for site surveying, drafting, applications on site. And I was thinking, like, these are really detailed, but smaller scale projects. And yet we have so many issues in terms of cost, schedule, coordination of people and trades. So how do professionals really handle those large scale construction projects in cities like Istanbul, especially where... It's really highly congested and construction actually daily impacts uh, people's lives. And during that experience, my mentors that I'd been working, I was working at the time, they told me that maybe I was just not only curious in these matters, but I was, I was also talented and they kind of pushed me towards project management. And I decided to do a master's in project and construction management. Uh, I was working in the industry during the time it became more and more obvious to me that I wanted to to learn more 
in this area and learn it from the best. And then I went for my doctoral studies to Penn State Architectural Engineering for, um, for learning this area in construction management uh, option. So I worked uh, on high performance, sustainable building project delivery uh, for my dissertation. And the, my interdisciplinary background, inter interest and experiences, they all shaped me into uh, what I work on today. And that's uh, how project teams in the built environment industry, how do they collaborate? How do they exchange information across disciplines and organizations and project teams? So we have better and more sustainable built environment products. So that's basically- Let yeah. me just jump in and ask you one question. Yeah, please. How did you get from Istanbul to Penn State? Oh, that's a, that's, <laughs> let's call it life. <laughs> let's call it life. There might be, uh, it looks like a long way, but uh, actually, Life, like if you're if you're really focused and you know what you want to do, uh, with a little bit of luck, uh, actually you get there. If you don't give up, uh, you have to just keep keep at it and keep knocking the doors. So it was it was a long journey, and it, it's it's a long ways from definitely Istanbul to Penn State, but it did happen. So that we need another two hour. <laughs> well, we're glad you got there, and I'm sure <laughs> Michigan State is too. Thank you. Yeah, I after I finished my um, doctoral studies in 2007, I joined uh, Michigan State in 2008. And since then, I've been doing research, teaching, uh, I've been doing service, and all has been actually around uh, this vision uh, that working uh, in interdisciplinary built environments and how do you improve communication, information exchange so that you have better and more integrated teams. And in January 2019, I became the program director in construction management. Cool. So tell us a bit about the program there, uh, the School of Planning, Design and Construction. Uh, at um, Michigan State. Tell us a little bit more about, about the overall arching curriculum and what you do, how many students you have, what your yeah. focus is. Yeah, sure. We have, in this school, we have four uh, separately accredited programs. Uh, construction management is one. Uh, we have uh, urban and regional planning, interior design and landscape architecture, as well as the National Sheriff Institute, which is a training and outreach and research unit. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting school in that um, fact, if you think about it, it's really uh, representing um, some of the um, professions of the built environment. Our CM program, construction management program, has a bachelor's and a master of science programs. We also have a PhD program for planning, design, and construction um, that focuses on whichever program you get your PhD at, in our case, uh, from construction management. So it's a dynamic, unique, unique environment. Uh, it's a great place um, uh, for especially what I'm passionate about. That's the interdisciplinary scholarship for collaboration in built environment industry. That's awesome. So we kind of started the whole program here today with talking a little bit about the ACRP and ACRP is Airport Cooperative Research Program. And so they funded a training, I mean, excuse me, a research project mm -hmm. on collaborative partnering and Sinem was the lead of this uh, big research project. So with that, I'm going to kind of just leave it up to you to tell us a little bit more about the research and kind of how it happened and Maybe we'll also work on some findings in the next question. Sounds great. So uh, let's start with what ACRP is. Uh, Airport Cooperative Research Program was established in 2005 by the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, mainly to uh, you know, solve common problems and assess innovations in service and operations, whatever airports need in an un uh, unbiased way that is presented. Uh, they, they needed real, reliable research. So each year, ACRP receives funding from FAA, uh, that's ACRP's program sponsor, and um, the governing board at ACRP uh, meets annually. Um, their oversight committee decides on priority projects and the budget, and then they release the approved list of projects, then they assemble a research and industry board panels to uh, basically steer the development of requests for proposals. So 
Then once those RFPs are out, then uh, teams from across the nation, they actually put in proposals, both qualifications and how they would actually attack attack, uh, the given research problem and how they would manage it. And then they're uh, competitively selected as uh, research contractors. And that's how uh, the process works. And for this collaborative partnering project uh, for airport projects, um, we put together a research team. So MSU, uh, I was the principal investigator. I had a research team at MSU and we worked with Brian Polkinghorn as a co-PI. Um, so, uh, and then we were the main two researchers on this team. Uh, we have six industry members that are uh, representing the airport industry and partnering and airport industry, both in design and engineering and construction sides so that uh, uh, we had a really qualified and large team. Um, so let me just jump in here and just uh, just let Construction Nation think about that. You, you probably hear about research and you go, oh, research, but look at the effort. It's just very similar to putting together a team for a project. It, it, this is a project and it has a beginning, a middle and, and an outcome with a deliverable. So it's not that dissimilar, but they're just looking at uh, research to find findings. So I think, it's, I think it's important for you to think about how similar the approaches are uh, in when you're doing research. So think about that, Construction Nation. Absolutely. We uh, actually have monthly progress reports to be submitted to ACRP during this project, and we have multiple meetings along the way with the panel and the program director to um, just make sure that we are delivering according to the quality metrics that they set up uh, while we are keeping actually our research rigor intact. So it's, it's quite challenging, especially uh, when you have uh, people from academia and the industry trying to just really <laughs> work things out and come up with this guidebook and respond to these research questions. It's, it's very interesting and challenging, but rewarding in our case, kind of a process. So tell us a little bit about some of the findings that have come out of this research. How long did the research take? It was a 14-month project, uh, so we, we followed a methodology uh, that was rigorous, so we could start with a state of the practice review and a survey of close to 100 people in the nation, which was followed by nine uh, case studies. Those were, those were partnered airport projects as our case studies. Uh, we wanted to make sure we represented all delivery methods, various budget sizes, both horizontal and vertical projects. And the aim basically was to provide airport specific guidance on the benefits and process of using collaborative partnering. So some of the overall findings was uh, that collaborative partnering is suitable for any project delivery method. Design to build, design build, construction management at risk, or a construction manager uh, as a general contractor. And uh, collaborative partnering is also scalable to most project types and risk involved, whether it is air side, land side, or terminal project. Um, partnering is suitable for uh, any size and type of airports, while the, feed, uh, the payback actually increases with scale and complexity. And the main benefits, and regardless of the size of the, or delivery method, was mainly a reduction in cost growth, in particular, significant reduction in cost of change orders and costs associated with claims. Um, we saw project deliver, projects delivered ahead of schedule and reduced liquidated damages. We saw improved productivity, quality, team integration, commitment to project goals, um, and the cost of partnering uh, was basically on average um, less than 0.2% of the overall project budget. So uh, if you think about the benefits that you receive, we found that the cost to be really uh, minimal. And one thing that we saw was the higher the risk in projects, um, the higher frequency of user partnering tools would be needed 
but the higher the benefit would be in those cases. Uh, and especially we saw that external third-party facilitation for partnering was crucial uh, for such high-risk uh, projects for optimal project outcomes. So those, those are just um, you know, a handful of some of our findings. So help us understand when you say that you found that partnering was suitable, what does that exactly mean? So um, in a world where we talk about team integration and there are uh, multiple methods, project delivery methods out there from design build to CM at risk or progressive design build to IPD, collaborative partnering uh, is a a set of, uh, it's a methodology, it's a set of practices that you can actually adopt under any, any type of project delivery method. Uh, There might be some nuances in the way that you adopt to tools, which we actually explained in our deliverables with the ACRP research, but it is suitable for any project delivery method and um, equally useful to uh, establish better integrated teams for all those kinds of projects. And if I'm hearing you right, you also found that there was a pretty good return on investment for the cost versus the benefits. The cost versus benefits, sometimes it's it, it's really tough to calculate, but on average, the partnering cost that goes into mainly uh, facilitation or if there are any uh, hard costs like the you know room rental or food for meetings, all of those combined. Uh, even though it changes based on the risk of the project, because then you have more frequent uh, partnering facilitation. Even though uh, the frequency changes, the average cost that you spend for partnering is less than 0.2%. Whereas uh, the cost growth were reduced, and that that was tied to adoption of partnering. In, in those projects, um, across all of the projects, uh, that, was, that was a common theme uh, that was reported by our uh, participants. That's awesome. So I know uh, as a result of this, one of the main things was to create a guide, mm-hmm. a, you know, a, a, an ACRP handbook. So tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about the handbook. Sure. So the guidebook mainly has two sections, and the first section is about how do you implement partnering, collaborative partnering effectively at project level. Then the second section is about optimizing that implementation within an organization. So between these sections, there's in total five chapters in the guidebook. Uh, The first chapter talks about collaborative partnering and its benefits. And one of the uh, important uh, variables that we found was getting top management support in adopting partnering. So what are the benefits? And if your project team is interested in adopting collaborative partnering, how can you obtain top management support? So that's the chapter one of our uh, of the guidebook. And in chapter two, uh, the readers can learn about the detailed tools of collaborative partnering from training to uh, issue resolution to stakeholder involvement or partnering uh, facilitator involvement. So uh, there are a number of tools. uh, That's where we talk about, introduce uh, the use of these tools as chapter two. Uh, In chapter three, the guidebook talks about how to select tools based on the level of risk in a given project and how to start using them at the right time in project delivery, depending on the method the project team is utilizing. So let's say uh, even if you are long way in the project and things are not going as planned, uh, you can adopt partnering as a turnaround partnering uh, and, and then still hopefully uh, turn around the outcomes. So that's that's another uh, actually uh, type of partnering that we talk about in this chapter three. Um, so chapter four then starts going into that second section I talked about, 
Uh, how do you manage key tools effectively so that you can optimize your implementation, especially selecting the right facilitator uh, and engaging your stakeholders in the right way in your project teams? And the final chapter is for organizations to assess and improve their organizational readiness to use collaborative partnering. So there's five chapters, pretty detailed, but it's it's an easy to digest uh, kind of a guidebook. Uh, we have appendices uh, for uh, you know sample tools for uh, additional resources to learn, and the whole guidebook is under a hundred uh, pages. So it's um, it's short and sweet. It sounds really exciting, and I know a lot of people out there could grab that and and look at it. And while I know it's aviation, it sounds like it would really any kind of projects you'd have, because in aviation you have horizontal, you have vertical, you have small, you have big, you have huge, you have all kinds of different types of projects. So I can't imagine it wouldn't apply really anywhere. You also oh, talked yeah. about it was scalable. How how does that happen? So the scalability happens, and it, it's it's one of the variables that play into the project risk. Uh, so the higher the project budget, the higher the risk. And it's not just the only variable that we look at in risk, but it's one of those. But basically, based on the level of risk in a project, the level of partnering that you should follow to optimize your outcomes uh, change. So the, the type of tools, the frequency of use of those tools, they all actually uh, are based on the level of risk in a project. So based on that risk and also the budget size, uh, the, the process of partnering uh, can be scaled and should be scaled actually to get the best outcomes for your, for your uh, money spent. And in the guidebook, it helps us to know what to do? Absolutely. It shows you how to calculate your risks uh, based on your project characteristics and then what uh, tools to follow and when to adopt them uh, in what ways. So it's it's pretty straightforward in that way. This is exciting because I do hear people uh, saying, gee, we're interested in maybe adopting structured collaborative partnering. But we're not quite sure what to do. So, hey, hey, Construction Nation, there's a guidebook out there now. Uh, you can grab that up. Yeah. I'm sure we'll be giving you some information as we go along here where you can get that. <laughs> I've actually uh, heard people recently when we presented uh, some of the outcomes and we had the guidebook, some of the people that recently adopted partnering, uh, they just came up to me and said, I, I wish we had the guidebook before. This would have just made our lives a lot easier. So, I've, so I have some anecdotal notes that way that uh, it, is, it is really helpful. That's wonderful. So this isn't your first uh, rodeo with uh, partnering. I know you've done other partnering research. Can you tell us more uh, or a little bit about the other research that you've done? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, So as I mentioned, partnering is one of the methods out there to help integrate project teams and improve uh, collaboration uh, in project teams, it really has been on my radar for long. So in 2014, the first research project that we did was to look at barriers to partnering in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry as, a, as an underutilized best practice and how to move forward. In 2015, we did a meta-analytic synthesis of partnering literature uh, in this industry that looked at uh, both the academic and industry-based uh, literature and just compiled all the lessons learned. And then in 2017, we did an in-depth study of the partnered project. Uh, that was a case study from the aviation industry. And that, that's very actually interesting for the first time. Uh, in our research, we started actually showing how communication over time in project delivery changes. And we were able to visually show that in that report. And then we were able to map it across project delivery in in a way that it would actually correspond in the same time intervals as the partnering 
the meetings and workshops during the uh, project took place. So we could actually see the impact over time. And that was very interesting. So after that, we worked on the ACRP project and the um, latest ones um, very recently in spring 2019, one of our uh, projects came out, reports came out. It's called Goal Alignment, Transactive Memory Systems and Performance in partner projects. And what that means is transactive memory systems is like the collective wisdom of the team. So when the team is aligned in their goals and taps into that collective wisdom in a structured way, uh, we saw via case studies that uh, it has positive impacts on both individual and project team performance. So that's uh, our most recently published report. And now we have an ongoing um, report, which I'm particularly excited about because so far uh, our project used data uh, on case studies or from people's perspectives. Uh, but we never had a large amount of project data we could look at quantitatively using statistical methods. So our ongoing project uh, is actually looking at over 120 partnered projects. In particular, uh, we're interested in seeing, okay, there is that project risk and then the level of partnering intensity in a project. Uh, so in, in so far in our research, we said that, you know, the higher the risk, the more intense your partnering should be. But is that really the case? Now we're working on an evidence-based research where we look at the fit between project risk and level of collaboration in a project and statistically seeing if that has an impact on performance outcomes, being cost growth, time, change orders, all of those performance outcomes. So I'm, I'm very excited. So that's ongoing and the report is going to come out uh, next year. Awesome. That sounds very exciting. But all the research sounds pretty exciting, actually, uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, you need to have that research to really prove the methodologies, to have a scientific approach to what is happening maybe organically in the industry, now we can say, yes, we know that these things are actually providing a, a significant result or they, perhaps they're not. Uh, so far, the research I think has shown that it is. I thought the barriers to partnering was very interesting as well. And so uh, a lot of times people don't really think about the barriers. And I also thought it was interesting you were talking about you had a whole chapter or section in the guide from ACRP on readiness. Yeah. So, you know, so you know, certainly that's something I realize that a lot of people just aren't ready for collaboration. Mm -hmm. I mean, if your culture is really harsh, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a nice way to put it, harsh, uh, yeah. perhaps uh, that's so inconsistent with collaboration that you, know, you get this huge culture clash and it's like a bomb going off. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, just like uh, whenever you're working in uh, heat transfer, anything like that, you got you have this heat that kind of goes boom. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, all these research projects are so sorely needed, I think, in the industry and so appreciated. Oh. And, I, and I, know that, uh, I know that this is an ongoing thing and hopefully it will continue to go on. And if anybody out there wants research, you can always go to the International Partnering Institute. I believe they have all these research uh, projects there on their website. And you yeah. can them. Uh, we'll also give you for the ACRP. I think there's a link we can give you at the yeah. end. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sanim, yourself, I know you have had challenges and your career. Uh, take us back to your worst moment. We like to know about where you had a challenge and it was really, really hard on you. Oh, wow. There's so many. Where do I start? But when I, when I look back, especially at the beginning of my career as a, uh, as a professor, the first couple of years is really challenging because 
you have so many great ideas, you have these caches and you think this is really interesting and you just put together these, you know, proposals and come up with these teams and it's just hard work. And then it's just a uh, rejection after rejection. It just feels like this a never ending cycle of revisions and resubmits. Um, but I think what I learned from that is that if you're if you're really passionate and working hard uh, and you have the right people that um, that are with you in your journey, uh, don't just get caught up with how devastating it is to be to, you know turned uh, turned back or just you know shut down. It's important to listen to feedback and uh, keep at it and never give up because uh, at the end of the day, somehow the stars line up. <laughs> and I think it's just hard work maybe paying off and just, you know, being at the right place at the right time goes a long way too. But I believe that if you don't really work hard, uh, it's very unlikely you'll be at the right place at the right time. So, uh, so when, when that happens and it's really rewarding, uh, and I especially like the fact that the research we do, it has a lot of theoretical implications, but it has immediate practical implications too. And when we, when we present it and people come to me and say, wow, this is exactly what we observe and, you know, we can, we could definitely use this, then it really all pays off for me. So that's really rewarding. So those challenges uh, are just kind of like a pass uh, to get there. And it's definitely worth it. Yeah. Again, sounds a lot like a construction project. Yeah. 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 It's a challenges, you know, a challenges every day. And that is where you allow yourself to have some creativity or build stamina to figure out. It's sometimes the things that are the hardest, the most difficult that do end up eventually coming into becoming this wonderful new thing. Yeah, and the most rewarding ones, yeah. absolutely. It often isn't easy. So I, I know that you're you're a leader of your program. You've led teams. You lead students. What do you think is your greatest strength as a leader? Well, I work at it every day. That's for sure. I, I learn uh, something new every day. But I think resilience and perseverance in general uh, are very important because uh, you have uh, people that look up to you. Uh, and you. I feel like I need to motivate them. Uh, I need to be the role model for them. So uh, I need to be the one that's upbeat uh, and that catalyzes uh, their energy. So I really think resilience and perseverance, they go a long way. Uh, but I think ability to connect with people is also very important so that we can use their strengths uh, because um, at the end of the day, people, re- people really bloom uh, if they work in the areas that they're passionate uh, about and they're curious about. So I think connecting with people and using their strengths um, in towards uh, a common purpose is really important so that uh, we have a learning community that we, where we challenge each other intellectually and we learn from each other so that uh, we're going in, growing in ways uh, that none of us actually can plan, uh, and that's what's exciting about it. One of the one of my favorite quotes is uh, by Adam Grant from Originals, the the book Originals: How Nonconformists Move the World, and that's uh, he says there the greatest shapers don't stop at introducing originality into the world. Uh, they create cultures that unleash originality in others. So, uh, I love that. You know that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I try to actually uh, live up to that, and it's I work at it every day. Yeah, that's awesome. So, what is the very best advice you have ever been given? Okay, so that one is a little tricky, but as easy as this: just do it. <laughs> Just do it was the very best advice I've ever gotten because uh, a lot of the times I find myself um, maybe 
overwhelmed under the weight of things that I need to do. And I want to wrap my head around it and get the full picture. And over the years, what I realize is uh, actually you just need to get to it and get started. And the, the goal and the picture, all of it, that keeps uh, changing its shape as you keep working at it. Uh, so you just need to get started with it uh, and not and don't linger around too much. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's so smart, especially also from a stress management standpoint. Absolutely. <laughs> just get out there and do it. Make it happen it. and you'll not. adjust as you need. Yeah, and uh, yeah, procrastination can really get in the way a lot of the times when you're thinking, you're just, you know, wrapping your head around it. A lot of the times you're just avoiding uh, a really tough task in front of you. Just get get a little bite at it uh, every day at a time and get to it. That sounds great advice for all of us. So I know you're there in a university setting and you probably are involved in technology all over the industry. What is your favorite piece of tech that you actually use? Well, at personal level, my favorite piece of technology is the voice recognition uh, in the notes section, actually, of my phone. Because as weird as it might sound, uh, the inspiration hits anywhere. (laughs) You never know. I might be driving. I might be picking groceries. I might be going from my office. I might be walking to the classroom and just uh, an idea comes and uh, there's there's no way that I can miss that. And I, I use very frequently the voice recognition in the notes section of my phone. And my students actually kind of got used to it. I have these long emails that they, they come to them and they, they were just they're sometimes curious, uh, how do you do that? How do you type up so much? So I tell them, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Another thing that everybody can use on your project wins, you yeah. have to remember that one thing and you don't have a way to write it down and you don't want to lose it. You, know, you have it in your phone. It's an yeah. excellent, excellent, excellent piece of tech. Yeah. Uh, so I, we ask everybody to give a gift to our listeners and uh, so I'm hoping that we will be able to get the ACRP guidebook link from oh, you. Oh, I'd be happy to. And I, the, the links can be really messy. So there's an easy way of getting to it. If you go to the National Academies Press, uh, their website. So it's www.nap.edu, National Academies Press, nap.edu. And there's just a search um, box right in the middle of that website. When it opens, search for airport partnering. And um, the ACRP research report, uh, the number is 196. It's Guidebook for Integrating Collaborative Partnering into Traditional Airport Practices. It comes up. Uh, it's for free as a PDF downloadable on, uh, on your computer. So hopefully you enjoy this gift. Yes, absolutely. We will put a link to it on the uh, show notes and also I'll write up this, uh, how to get to it on their own too. So that sounds good. So, um, I believe you have a website, uh, also, and that's the best way for us to get a hold of you. Is that right? Yeah. Um, This research, in addition to all of the research projects that we work on and our publications, our research team, all of that is uh, accessible, available via our research team's website. It is uh, www.iopt4.msu.edu. So I need to break that down a little bit. So IOPT4 stands for Interorganizational Project Teams. Uh, for innovation, collaboration, and sustainability. So uh, we abbreviated that to IOPT4 uh, as uh, number four. So I opt for research team uh, at MSU. Uh, that's our research team's website. And uh, all my information, contact information, everything is accessible via that website. And I will put that uh, on the show notes as well. Wonderful. So everyone, can, Wonderful. everyone will be able to find it there. So 
What is your parting advice for us? Something that maybe we could start doing today or tomorrow to really integrate project delivery, kind of make it our focus, apply partnering, use the guidebook. What, what, what might your, be your advice? Oh, I, um, I'm just going to go along those lines. Um, in today's construction, integrated project delivery is a focus. And um, regardless of the delivery method, partnering, collaborative partnering gives you the tools and the process to achieve that. Uh, and it's applicable to any project at any stage. So um, the guidebook would really help. You can just pick it up. As I mentioned, it's for free as a PDF online. And on pages one to six of the guidebook, there's a list of benefits and tools. It's just a very brief snapshot. If you feel like, oh, I don't have the time to just go through a guidebook of 100 pages, there's that just couple pages, five, five pages of benefits and tools that you can grab and use to pilot collaborative partnering on your project. So... Hopefully, you can check it out. You know, the, the, our our uh, audience here can check the guidebook out and see if it is something that they could actually, uh, you know, utilize and pilot in their first partnering project. Yeah. Do you have an adv- any advice on kind of what kind of project to pilot first? Well, what kind of project to pilot first would not be my advice, but if you're piloting partnering, the best way would be working with an external partnering facilitator. And if it is a uh, by any means risky project from the budget or location perspective, let's say if you're crossing with any um, walking traffic or the security checkpoints in airport projects, Uh, or you have a large number of stakeholders involved. So if by any means it is a high-risk project, I would highly suggest uh, utilizing uh, the guidebook and partnering for it. Uh, But regardless of risk, the first project that you go for, uh, I highly suggest using external facilitators. And in the um, back of the guidebook, uh, there are actually there's a there are lists of uh, resources to actually either find partnering facilitators that are qualified or how to determine the qualifications and the fit of a facilitator for your project. So the guidebook would would really help in those two. Excellent, excellent advice for everybody. So I hope everyone will grab the the book uh, guidebook, look at it share it with others. I mean, I know that's why these research projects occur so that they can be shared and spread across the industry. So uh, Construction Nation, pay it forward and share it with everyone, please. So I want to thank you so much, Sanim, for coming today and sharing your expertise and the research that you've been working on. It's so exciting to see it Uh, coming out and more true research, the science behind it. I always think there's a lot of art we know, but now to get the science also behind it is an essential component for building the foundation of truly collaborative cultures, I think, in the industry. And I'm just so thankful for you and the research that you're doing over these past several years and look forward to reading more research as it it emerges. So uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Sue. It's my, uh, it's my pleasure. Okay, Construction Nation. Remember, dream teams do not just happen. They don't grow on trees. You have to make it happen one step at a time. And today's episode gave you another tool that you could use to help build your dream team. So get that book, get the link. You can send that to everybody. Send it to your whole team. Send it to the people that you're working with that you think, man, I wish they were more collaborative. Here is some research that you could share with them. And why not have a discussion group about it? Get everybody together and talk about, could this be something we want to implement? I know I'm going to be doing that. So I hope you will too. Also, remember that Construction Dream Team drops every Monday morning at 4 a.m. And so it's there for you as you're driving to work, driving to the job, driving home from the job. It's there. Please listen. Please share. Please let us know what you think. And also give us your feedback. Anybody you want to hear from or any topic you want to hear, 
send it to me and we will find someone and we will get them on here. Again, Sanem, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sue. And thanks, con thanks, Construction Nation, for listening. Talk to you next time. <laughs>